I'm Dr. Sidney Smith, and with me is Dr. Neil Stone. We're going to talk today about the new cholesterol-lowering guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. Neil was the co-chair of these guidelines, and it's a great uh, pleasure to have him with us. We're going to talk about primary prevention. Primary prevention, if we really did it well, there'd be no need for secondary prevention. So it's a really key consideration but uh, sometimes tough to get our arms around what we should be doing and w what really is the best approach. What are the new ideas that we have in these guidelines? Sir? Yeah, that's a great point, Sid. If I could just further, just one second what you said. If we were successful in primary prevention in our 20s and 30s and reached age 50 without major risk factors, very few people would need to take a statin, for example, because they'd be so low risk. So it's a real challenge for all of us to do a better job, especially younger. But in a nation where almost one in three dies of a heart attack and six out of 10 heart have heart disease, prevention comes right up to the fore. And now these guidelines have built on previous guidelines by really enhancing and um, improving the clinician-patient risk discussion. Yeah, and that discussion seems to be very important. If we're talking about primary prevention, the patient has to have some idea of why it's important. Exactly. In other words, we're using the pooled cohort equations. Fortunately, they've been uh, validated in a large uh, natural history study. Uh, we now know that uh, for many people, they, they work fine, but there are some people who are very high risk. For example, South Asians, people with inflammatory a disease where you'd have to take that into account, the risk equation will be too low, the risk will be too low. And some people for whom the risk uh, equation would, would overestimate, like uh, fortunately healthy people, people who participate in some of these clinical trials, uh, some of them do such a good job that it really overestimates. But for the bulk of people, it does a good job right in the middle part of the risk curve. That's why the, uh, the risk assessment begins the uh, risk discussion. That's really important, I think. Uh, risk assessment, discussion. At what point do you do the lipid panel? Do you uh, sit down, do the new guidelines recommend sitting down with a patient and talking about cardiovascular risk, doing the assessment? And then is there any point in that where you would not do a lipid panel? Well, the new guidelines start with uh, an assessment of lipids. And one of the new things we've pointed out is that you can be non-fasting. This is going to be a big boon to patients who show up in their doctor's office in the afternoon, for example. But a non-fasting lipid panel will allow you to get lipids. You can feed it into the risk estimator that looks at your age, your sex, your race, cholesterol, HDL, diabetes or not, blood pressure, treated or not, smoking. And then with that risk assessment, the doctor can begin to talk to you about where you fit on this risk continuum. Yeah, the point I'm trying to make is, is that the lipid panel provides information that is used for risk. And so it's really a return visit when you're going to sit down and say, here's what we know about you. That's true, although a number of people get, sometimes they get blood work before they see so they the doctor. In. So that, that may be a, a, a special uh, a chance for, for example, a person to say, you know, before my next visit, maybe I'll get certain basic labs before that annual exam so we're, we can talk about my risk right off the top. When you're talking about risk and you're assessing it, what are the points where primary prevention in terms of therapy and discussion is really important? If they come in and they have a risk of less than 5%, is that a different group? Yeah, than so we, we divide risk into, into to these categories, less than 5% low, 5 to 7.4 borderline, 7.5 to 19.9. We call it an intermediate group, and then 20% or higher high risk. If they're low, less than 5% or high, 20% or more, the risk decision is fairly simple. And the one group who are low risk, you're gonna really work on lifestyle to prevent risk factors from developing. And the other group who's already got risk factors, that's how they got to 20% or more they're going to have to talk about uh, lowering LDL substantially and almost always need a high intensity statin. So that leaves the middle group, the, um, the borderline risk who will tend to be younger and then the intermediate risk, 7.5 to 19.9, uh, .9, where previous guidelines showed that they're, they're a group who benefits from statin therapy for large scale 
primary prevention trials show that giving a statin to people uh, with this level of risk can benefit, but it's just the start. When you sit down and talk with them, what are the important points to uh, emphasize? What are some of the other factors that the new guidelines bring into play? Any other tests that you might consider? Good point. So in addition to discussing major risk factors, the new guidelines bring in enhancing factors. Enhancing factors are patient characteristics that inform the risk discussion. They include a family history of premature heart disease. That can make a big difference to explain to a patient why they especially are, are gonna, gonna benefit. Two, LDL greater than 160. The higher the LDL, the greater the risk in part, and we don't wanna neglect those with LDLs 160 or higher. Uh, three, metabolic syndrome, a bunch of metabolic traits related to abdominal obesity, high sugar, high triglyceride, uh, high blood pressure, and low HDL that indicate a greater a tendency to both diabetes and early heart disease. Um, chronic kidney disease, uh, that um, estimated GFR of 15 to 59. Uh, all of these are, are so important. And then we've added uh, other enhancing factors uh, uh, like uh, spe special to women, like a, a premature uh, menopause less than age 40 and a, um, uh, uh, a pregnancy factor if they were pregnant, such as uh, a preeclampsia. We've also talked about markers like a triglyceride. If it's persistent, over 175 and it's a primary cause, that could be another factor. And then we have the if measured category for enhancing factors. Two old ones, ankle brachial index, less than 0.9, and uh, HSCRP, that inflammation test that has been used for years. But now we've added to that uh, uh, with, with a special consideration um, APOB uh, and uh, especially in those with high triglycerides and then perhaps a, an LP little a, especially in those with a family history of premature atherosclerosis. And the cut point for LP little a is 50. So we set, we set the cut points higher than just the normal. We set them at roughly the 80th percentile. So uh, more than 50 if you're measuring the cholesterol and if you're doing nanomoles per liter above 125. And would you include age in this? Age, age, is, factored, age is factored heavily into the, the risk assessment. It's there already. So it's, it's actually there already, so I don't know if we need to put that in again. When are you going to calculate the, the, the risk? Between what ages are you looking at calculating well, the 40 to seven, 40 to 75 is the tenure risk. Under 40, there's still a chance to get an idea of where you stand with a lifetime risk, the same inputs to the risk calculator. But the risk calculator only has data 40 to 75. Now you mentioned, I think, the coronary calcium scan. How does that figure? You're not doing that in everybody. No, no. Uh, the previous guidelines recommended uh, the HSCRP and the ABI and family history and the calcium scan LDL more than 160 is other factors, but now these guidelines um, have looked carefully at the data that we've developed about the calcium scan, how it informs people's risk assessment as used by the pool cord equation. We did a systematic review of this, and what it shows is that if um, you're in the intermediate risk range, not real high, not real low, you don't need to do a calcium score then, but in the intermediate risk range, and you're still undecided after this personalization where we look at your risk score, we look at the enhancing factors, you're still un undecided, then a calcium score can divide you into zero, uh, one to 99, and 100 or more to greatly enhance your understanding of so-called whether you need a statin or not. And, and it's probably worth mentioning the groups that the uh, pooled cohort uh, equations actually give you good risk and those where there may be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Yeah, and, um, so uh, if, if you look at the calcium score and you get a, a score of either 100 or greater or you're more than 75th percentile, then in this borderline and intermediate risk range, those people benefit from a statin. If um, you're one to 99, it tends to favor a statin, especially if you're over 55, but if you're under the 75th percentile, perhaps uh, 
you uh, may want to uh, defer that decision about a statin. And if you're zero, calcium score is zero, that's, a, that's an enviable place to be because uh, unless you're a smoker, have diabetes, or a strong family history, usually means you can defer, postpone the, the decision regarding a calcium uh, a statin for five to 10 years. So I'm going to go back to the PCE, the po pooled cohort equation, and, and look at the estimates there. Uh, good in, in Caucasian, good in African American, HIV maybe underpredicts. Exactly, uh, Asian, that's a great point, uh, yes. Uh, that in those with inflammatory disease who are higher risk, it may underpredict. So we've got to take, if you're South Asian, you've got a higher risk. That was, by the way, another enhancing factor that we said. So I'm glad you brought that up, that uh, uh, the clinician needs to look at the patient and personalize how does this risk assessment pertain to you. Likewise, if you come from a healthcare system and you've maintained perfect health for a long time, the risk estimation may, may be falsely uh, high a little bit because you really have done such a good job for so long. So knowing some of these factors uh, can help you personalize your, your, your risk decision. You've been, in, we both have been in practice for a long time and we've, we've dealt with this. I'm wondering how you feel about uh, the importance of teams, nurses, nutritionists. Do you have the guidelines have something to say about that? And is there a take home message there uh, if we're gonna get this job done? I think one of the striking things about the guideline is that it took a team to develop. We have nurses, we have pharmacists, uh, we have uh, uh, epidemiologists, as well as endocrinologists, as well as cardiologists. So the, the very nature of the guidelines speaks to the idea of a team. And I think as we see more complicated uh, 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 drug regimens in patients who may have multiple illnesses, the addition of a pharmacist, which was encouraged in 2013 and very much encouraged now, is very important. And I wonder, if, as we move this out and have these guidelines implemented, I can't imagine that it's going to all be done by cardiologists. There's going to have to be a network, a referral set up where there are internists, family practitioners, but at a point they, they need to bring in a person like yourself that has a team, that has the ability to take it to, to uh, the, another level. To another level. I will say this, if you look across from a patient and the patient says, how do I prevent a heart attack or stroke? Or how do I prevent the next heart attack or stroke? Then these guidelines give you new tools to make that possible. Well, that's a good note to end on, or at least begin on, right. in terms of getting them out. <laughs> Thank that's you, right. Neil. It's been Thanks, excellent. Ed.